Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Beyond Eight Figures. I have a really great guest on, Ray Titus of the United Franchise Group, and we're going to really dive into some cool stuff about the franchise business. But first, Ray, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be on uh, and, and spend some time this morning. Cool. I really appreciate this. I was going through your background. I was going through the business. As a matter of fact, as I was just joking with you before we started recording, since I am actively looking to buy a business, I literally now have had, I think in the past two days, like four or five different brokers from Transworld, which is one of the franchises you guys own, that like, I've been talking to the different brokers and stuff. So it was like, that makes so much sense. It's a franchise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one, Transworld has really taken off over the last 12 yeah. years that we've built it and grown it and become the world's largest business brokerage. And so it's exciting to be able to, I, it happens all the time. I meet people that are looking at businesses or considering businesses, and they're already talking with one of our Transworld business advisors. What I really love, you know, and just kind of going back into your background, it's like you have franchising in your blood. Your dad was the founder of Minuteman Press, which I kind of grew up seeing all the time out there in that sort of first wave of printing company, you know, and I never even knew they were a franchise. And then, you know, you started back in the 80s, Sinorama, and then from there, United Franchise Group, which is such a cool concept of B2B, both from the franchises you own, but also the capabilities you've, if that's the right terminology, that you have for helping other entrepreneurs turn their businesses into franchises. So it's such a cool, you know, it's like, hey, we have them and then we can help you build them from scratch. So, well, we've kind of gone full circle. I remember growing up and the Clockman logo was on our dining room table. Okay. <laughs> I remember that. And press, yeah. Okay. So, I grew up in an entrepreneurial house and, and many other people don't get that opportunity. The first introduction to franchising or entrepreneurship comes when they're older and they've gone through a career of some kind. I grew up in a household. My eighth grade school paper was how to start a franchise company. So, I mean, I was born and raised to do what I've been doing for the last 37 years. Okay. So when I got out of college, I went to work with my dad and we started Sinorama. Now he had already had a very, very successful franchise company, Minuteman Prep for many, many years. And we opened up a sign shop in Farmingdale, Long Island in New York, where I'm from. Long Island. And Long Island yeah. guy, Oyster Huntington. Bay, Oyster Bay. Oh, Huntington. Yeah. Okay. Huntington. Well, that's where we used to go to have a good time. Okay. Yes. Huntington's Finnegan's. Great. I was Huntington. raised in Finnegan's. <laughs> great. <laughs> Finnegan's. And there was a place there that had a white Artful Dodger. There was oh. something gardens, I think. Artful Dodger was another one. Yeah, but was, there was yeah. a lot of great restaurants. We'll call them restaurants on the uh, podcast. But Underage they, drinking they, spots. They were pubs. Yeah. Okay? And, yeah. And, and, but you could walk to all of them, which was a really, really good thing. And so, but growing up, I came out of college, went to work with my dad. We started Sinorama and we never looked back. Okay. So a year later, we started franchising and Today, we have 10 brands, 1,600 franchise owners in 80 countries worldwide. And this has been a 37-year progression as an organization. And, and we became United Franchise Group. But, you know, a lot of people think that this is something that happened very quickly. And I'll keep saying 37 years, okay? Because the first 14 years, we were only Sinorama. That was it. And, and, and so we then added our second brand, which was Embroid Me, which it, later we renamed to fully promoted to better suit the products and services that they sell. But that's after that is when we started to become a multi-branded organization. So I know we were talking earlier about stages of growth and, and times where you, and we went from being one 1500 square foot sign shop on Long Island to a franchise company of 150 or 200 sign shops to then a multi-branded franchise company adding a, a second brand to 
Then we started looking like our shirts had all the logos on them. So we started looking like NASCAR racers. Okay. And, I and, wanted to see one of those shirts. Right? And so, so we had to come up with a name. We didn't have United Franchise Group as a name first. We came up with it after we had three, four different brands. And we put it as an umbrella name for our company. And, and so, like I said, we've gotten to 10 brands and around the world. And, you know, we've got franchises in South Africa, India, to England, to Australia, where we have almost 200 franchisees with our different brands in Australia. That has been a great country for us in New Zealand and Canada to all over the world. And then that led us to the next stage of growth, which was franchise services for franchisors. So first, turning them into a franchise. So we offer through Accurate Franchising Incorporated, we offer the ability to take your business and idea and turn it into a franchise company. And that means the owner's manual of operations. That means the franchise disclosure document. That means the training program. It, you know, everything that from sales and marketing to turn it into a franchise company. Now we can take that and just work as a consultant, hand it back to the entrepreneur, and now it's a franchise and they do with it whatever they want and that's fine. Or if they want to utilize our company and our experiences, we have another company called Franvesco, which does the marketing and sales for franchise companies. So maybe there's somebody, we turn it into a franchise and they're not good at sales or they want somebody else to handle the sales. We do that on a commissionable arrangement and we'll sell the franchises for them. We also have a program called Exit Factor, which prepares businesses to be sold. It's a program that entrepreneur can go through if they're interested in potentially selling their business, but maybe it's not ready to be sold. Maybe another year or two, cleaning up the books, cleaning up the business, you know, yes. just kind of getting it prepared to sell. Yeah. There's an awful lot of entrepreneurs that sell their business and lose out on a lot of value that they, <laughs> that they could have had yet. if they just took another six months or a year and cleaned up some things and you, it would go to a different buyer for a lot more money. And then obviously we have Transworld, which is one of our franchise brands, but then they also help businesses sell. And so, yeah, we have a lot of different services that we have. We have uh, Titan Franchise Services, which is Again, helping franchise companies with leads and getting leads. So we have all of these different companies. We also have a technology division where we take ownership stakes in different technology companies for franchise companies. And so okay. we're always trying CRMs, to tie in the franchising such, side yeah. of things because that's our expertise. Whenever we get out of franchising, it's, it's kind of hit or miss when we get out of franchising. You know, it's not usually a good thing. So I like to keep us, you know, the guardrails in, in franchising. So we established a company called Starpoint Brands, which Starpoint Brands is now the umbrella name for all our franchise companies. And United Franchise Group is over Starpoint Brands, but then all our service companies Services. for the franchise orders out there. So it kind of, sometimes if people get confused by if we were just United Franchise Group with all these franchise brands and all these services, like, what are you? And so we have to have differentiation in those different things. So it, it works. I mean, it is really cool because one of the theses that I've been developing from having my own experience as an entrepreneur, but then also having you know, amazing guests like you come on the show is a lot of the public expectation of an entrepreneur is the Zuckerbergs, the Bezos, without realizing that Bezos really was you know, in the back office of a bunch of investment firms for many years before he went off and created Amazon or you know, Microsoft. It's like most entrepreneurs do something small and just incrementally for a very long time, directionally correct, improve the business to then something happens, that transition. We're all of a sudden, you know, as you said, 14 years and then boom, things started growing. And it's like, it's that years of putting in what I call the reps that is so fascinating. You know, it's like, here you are, you have this huge, this really cool, huge, incredibly well-developed flywheel of a business. And yet it was, in hindsight, very incrementally, very directionally focused. But you know, 
that's some hard work to do. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a constant, you know, it's every day, it's every week, it's every month. But I'm blessed to have my family involved in this business as yeah. well, because that's not only son. did, yeah. you know, my dad helped me. Now I brought my sons in. So I have that's three fun. sons in the business. I have three nephews in the business. We have 15 second generation employees at United Franchise Group. So it's a very tight knit unit. And that helps that whole thing, you know, it helps during the pandemic. It helped during the 08, 09 recession. It, it helps to have people that you're really tight with that you can really bunker down and really make things happen and, and create something really, really big here, which is kind of what we've done. But it, like you said, it's not overnight. It's a, you know, and, and, you know, please don't put me in the Zuckerberg Bezo category, <laughs> but franchising is, you know, been so good to my family and to myself and my uh, wife and everyone that we decided to do a give back. And we did, uh, we established the Titus Franchise Center for at Palm Beach Atlantic University. In fact, it was the first franchise school in the United States. And so we're real proud of that. There's been a lot of others that have come along after that. And that's awesome. We want more and more universities to embrace franchising and we want to help them. You know, we've given out to schools like Babson in Massachusetts. That's a great school. We've given them, you know, our curriculum and, and work with their people there. We've worked with Tennessee, University of Tennessee. We've worked with Louisville, uh, University of Louisville that has a franchise school as well. So we're really, really all about franchising and want to help the kids learn that there's a career out there in franchising for them. There's an opportunity to own your own business. I'll never forget when we, we announced that we were making this large donation and establishing the Titus Franchise Center at Palm Beach Atlantic University. It was downtown West Palm Beach. It was a pretty big deal. They had a lot of reporters and and at the end, they opened it up for any questions. And the first question I get asked, now I kid you not, the first question I get in front of about 500 people is, I don't understand why you would want to teach kids to flip hamburgers, okay? <laughs> so I went at that guy, Think about okay? Yeah. I mean, he's, he said the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong person. And so I said, we are not teaching kids to flip hamburgers. They could figure that out on their own, okay? We're teaching them to own a McDonald's, to run a franchise company, to establish and build and grow the next level of franchise companies that are going to come utilizing AI and utilizing technology that we're not even familiar with now for down the road. And you're missing the boat completely if you think we're teaching them for minimum wage jobs. They can get those minimum wage jobs right now without me and without this donation and without this schooling. But the, the key is to teach them about the franchising industry and understand when they go out out of college, they have a resume. They've interned here at United Franchise Group. They've interned at Chick-fil-A. They've interned at a lot of these places around West Palm Beach and, and great businesses and schools and you know, I could go from like the Breakers Hotel, which is a part of the intern program to, I mean, some of the best in the world right here that they will work with and they, they get full-time jobs, they get a leg up. And so that's really what we're established with the Titus Franchise Center. Well, I want to kind of dive into that, but first, you know, for you, where do you see yourself as an entrepreneur nowadays because you have success you have the family and the business all the concepts of what most people think of entrepreneurial success and then some how do you see yourself as an entrepreneur these days well it's funny you ask that because i've been reflecting a little bit since december because i turned 60 in december Congratulations! And, yeah. yeah thank you i made 60 right and so all that means to me is there's a better chance i'll make 70 now Okay. Yep. And so hmm. when you hit 70, hit the there's a better chance you'll hit 80. Right. And so, but really I don't ever in my past spend a lot of time reflecting on things. We celebrate them when we achieve them, but I don't spend a lot of time reflecting on all the accomplishments over the 37 years. I'm really more focused on the future. And 
I've always had the mindset that when you're spending more time thinking about and talking about the past than you are the future, you probably should get out. Okay. That's been my mindset. So the younger employees in our company keep me younger, at least mentally. Okay. And keep me sharp. And, and I understand things, you know, that m maybe some others that are in their sixties and seventies don't understand because they don't work with 25 year olds, 30 year olds on a regular basis. My COO is 32 years old, but the president of Starpoint brands is a 31 year old. Okay. So our director of marketing at UFG is a 26 year old. Okay. So I can go right around our whole organization and tell you, you know, person after person after person. Now, where do I see myself in the future? I see myself more helping utilize my experience in directing the future of the organization, where not only from the P&L side, but from the creative side. So recently, and I'm a big book reader. Okay. And, and I know some people, the last time they picked up a book was in college. I am a big believer in lifelong learning. Okay. That's one of my big things. And, and so I read 40 to 50 books a year and I look to take out three, four, five points out of every single book and apply that in our business or apply that in my life. And I've been doing that for years, 20 years. Okay. At least I also write one book a year. I've been doing that for seven years. So I have my cool. eighth book coming out. But we'll have my, to lift, my lift point is, yeah, my, yeah, my point is with the books is they change, they change you for the better. They change your business for the better if you let them. So I'll give you an example. Mike Michalowicz did a book called Profit First. Okay. Yeah. Profit, I've, I've Profit been First reading changed, that recently. Yeah. Profit First changed United Franchise Group for the better. I have him actually coming to our World Expo in Nashville next year, where we get all our brands together and we'll have five or six speakers that come in. He's one of them that's coming in and to speak to the whole group about this. So at different stages, when you talk about the stages of growth, what's funny for me is I can actually point to a book that helped me through cool. those stages, right? So like yeah. in the early stages, there was a book called, and I still pass it out. I pass out books every week here. It's called Straight Line Leadership. Okay. The book Straight Line Leadership helped me personally become better. Okay. And it helped a lot of our key employees in the organization. You know, and as you go like Lincoln on Leadership or the Rockefeller Habits, or like I can point to different books that are, the book right now. I'll give you a book right now that is actually helping us tremendously right now as a company. It's called The Six Types of Geniuses by Patrick Lencioni. I heard another entrepreneur talk about it. Okay, please it's his keep going. Book, yeah. Okay, it's his newest book. Like He did The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. He did Death by Meeting. He's probably one of the best authors in the United States, okay? But nobody hears about him because he does business books, right? And so what I would tell you is this is his best book. This is his best book. It's amazing. And so it helps you as a person kind of see where you fit in with an organization. But for me, it's helping me because I have my whole board of directors, my senior management team, all doing this test that he has. And then you outline, he has six different, he calls them geniuses. They're, they're basically uh, personality traits or whatever you want to call it, but it's six different items. And two of them that you're really good at and you love doing. Two of them, you're good at them, but you don't love doing them, but you're yeah. good at them. And two of them you really dislike, like yes. two, two that you just don't, you may have to do them, but you don't like doing them at all. And it takes every person and gives them two, two, and two in each one of those categories. And then you could take your whole team and kind of see what you're lacking and what you're like. I literally remember a meeting a couple of weeks ago that it was a frustrating meeting. And I look back on it after reading the book and I know why it was frustrating. Okay. Now I know I had the wrong people there. I, I needed to have a couple other different people that would have helped kind of curve out that meeting and make it less frustrating and get to the conclusion that we needed to get to, but we didn't. Okay. And so books have been a big part of my life. That is very cool. And very, yeah. One, I expect to see a newsletter on 
the reading and suggested readings at different on a regular basis from you. But that is really cool because yeah, I I've had that same situation. Yeah, you know, I joke that um someone had been reading or someone told me about Walker Dayables uh by then grow. And yeah, I read a lot of business books, but most of the time it's like, okay, I sometimes I'm like, why can't they just do twenty pages instead of like <laughs> two hundred pages? It's like there's twenty pages of good stuff and but I remember picking up that book and being like, this makes so much sense. So therefore I've now spent the past year and a half chasing down that rabbit hole, but like I've seen it in other things. Yeah. You know, even other non-business book, watching my son become fascinated with environmental science because of a specific science fiction book. He loves uh, ministry of the ministry of the future by Kim Stanley Robinson. And it's just like, it is so fascinating where reading the books help, but every once in a while, they just lock you in to some, they hit you differently. Well, I'll share, I'll share with you what happened to me. Okay. I, I, I went to high school and college. I went on a basketball scholarship and in college, my priorities were probably a little messed up. Okay. So what I would say is, <laughs> you know, in, I, I think most of us in college, we like to enjoy our college years, right? Well, my priorities were basketball first, right? And then maybe girls, or beer, I don't know which one, you know, girls or beer. beer girls. And then yeah. it would be schoolwork to get a good enough grade so that I was eligible to play basketball. Okay. That was it. Okay. So they, that was my cycle and it wasn't good. So anyway, I come out of college, we start Signorama and we have three or four employees. And on a Friday afternoon, I decide let's get a group meeting. We don't have a lot going on right now. Let's have a group meeting and let's talk about ways we can improve this business. And so we get everybody in, in a table and I remember like it's yesterday. Right. And so it, it, you know, what can we do to improve the business? What can I do? What can, you know, as we're going through and as we're coming up with suggestions, one of the older employees there says, Ray, I think what we ought to do is strategic planning. And I looked at him and I said, I think that's a great idea, but it, you know, it's Friday, it's five o'clock. Why don't we break for the weekend and we'll come back on Monday and we'll get right into strategic planning. Great. We break, I walk out, and I said to myself, what the hell is strategic planning, <laughs> right? Plan. I, I'm yeah. 23 years old. I had no idea what strategic planning was. So I went to this place that has all these books in it. It's called the library. Now, most people today nev have never heard of it because they just Google and Amazon, and they don't ever have to go to a library, right? But here's the reality. I went there, and I went and found a book from Jack Welch, which he was the chairman of GE at the time. And he did a book, uh, and one of the chapters was on GE's strategic plan. So I took that book, and I memorized that chapter. I went right to chapter 17 and memorized that part of the book, right? Because why would you want to read the other chapters? It would make no sense, right? It, so I just focused on that strategic planning, came in on Monday morning, said, let's get into strategic planning. And I just gave it. Like I, I, I was in a 1500 square foot sign shop on Long Island giving GE strategic plan, but I tweaked it a little bit to make it fit us, yeah. right? And then we take this break. And as I'm walking out, I hear one of the employees say, man, Ray's unbelievable on strategic planning. <laughs> and I get in my office and I shut the door and I remember laughing, right? Because Friday, I didn't even know what strategic planning was. And Monday, I'm brilliant, okay? But I stopped laughing because I realized I've been an idiot, that everything I want in life is in a book and I just have to find the right book. So I started reading one book a month and taking good ideas. And a funny thing started happening. I started getting better and I could actually see it. I remember my mom saying, you know, I don't know what's gotten into you the last year, but you're really a different person. You're changing in front of us. Like, and I, and then I started reading two books a month and three books a month. And then I was doing a lot of traveling because we were opening up stores all over and franchises all over the world. And um, I, I had a lot more time and I'm reading four books. Of, of So again, I had the advantage of having that time in the planes to read the books which I would always look to take out four or five great points to improve my life and to improve my business. 
I just kept it going. And we just kept getting better and better and better. And we challenge our employees to, to read the books. We, I pass out books to the franchisees in training school. I do it at conventions. I'd do it here if we were face-to-face. I'd give you a book, okay? And that's kind of my thing is, you know, staying that lifelong learning. So, yes, I've reflected being 60, but I'm looking forward to the next 10 years being the best years of our company. And how can I help that? It's not going to be the same work ethic that I had when I was 25 and 30 years old. You know, I I openly five o'clock, I'm getting tired. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, I mean, it's so, you know, but, but we're managing with that and the young group can, it's really been a good combination. We've got, you know, a lot of long-term employees and then we have a lot of young employees and that combination of experience and really grit, the, which is an, another great book out there called Grit, okay? Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. So, which is great for entrepreneurs to read, okay? Forget the woman's name that wrote it, really strong book too. But always looking at how do we improve this business? How do we improve the model? How do we get better? How can we help our franchise owners be more successful? We have a mission statement here which I have to credit Patrick Lencioni, okay? So he he did a seminar for 25 CEOs, and I was fortunate enough to be one of those 25 CEOs to go. And it was a one-day event, and he, he wanted to talk about mission statement. Okay, and yeah. literally my mission statement was three paragraphs long. It was on the one wall in a conference room, and it it basically did everything but uh, you know solve world peace. Okay, I mean it was a ridiculous mission. Yeah, statement. mission statements are very hard. They're very. Yeah. We we came, we felt good after we did it, but nobody ever looked at it again. Okay. Yeah. So done. at this seminar, Lencioni asks me to stand up and give our mission state, and I don't know it at that point. Oops. Yeah. Right. So it was one of the more embarrassing moments of my career. And I, you know, he said, well, how do you hire by it? How do you fire by it? How do you run your business by it? Okay. How do your employees even know it if you don't know it? Like your mission statement, I said, it's three paragraphs long. It's on a wall, so, uh, on a conference room. And he said, it needs to be one sentence and everyone needs to know it. And everybody has to live by it. And I flew home from that meeting and I wrote down, we have one customer, our franchisee, when they're successful, we're successful. And went into the conference room, took the three paragraphs down, had that put up. Then I had a meeting with our, our company and I said, here's our mission statement, learn it because I'm gonna ask you starting tomorrow and if you don't know it, I'm gonna fire you. You gotta know the mission statement. You gotta live the mission statement. It's one sentence. If you can't memorize one sentence, you shouldn't be here. And then all of a sudden, people started living by it and we started growing by it and we started hiring by it and we started firing by it. And we started doing things that, you know, all of a sudden people would be, you know, cause our focus is always on the franchise. If they're the more successful they are, the more successful we are. The, the more franchises we sell, the more royalties we collect. It's all based on the success of the franchise. I love that because what I have found from interviewing entrepreneurs like yourself is so often the concept of a mission statement and as i've got you know i had a multiple consultants over different many periods of times come in and yeah you get those yeah blah 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 blah. and then you know maybe you remember a little bit and there's no there's no nothing that is action driven from how you do that yet i've seen like from your process and other entrepreneurs that have continued or have put the effort in to bring it into the life. And it's usually, you know, once again, that incremental, all of a sudden it's such a powerful value add. Yeah. You know, you know what the when problem, it's done. You, know, you know what I've seen the problem is people don't attach actions with the mission statement. So for instance, we have a mission statement, right? And you say, okay, what does that really mean to anybody? Well, I go to my employees and I say, look, if I'm in your office or I'm on the phone with you and a franchise owner calls you, you put me on hold and you take their call. Let's understand each other. If two people walk into our, our headquarters and one's a franchisee and one's a prospect, a vendor, a supplier, uh, somebody else, 
you greet the franchisee first. They're our customer. And so we needed to get, you know, we knew that. People knew that, but they weren't always living by it. And, and that changed years ago. So like you talk about these stages of growth, I, I can point back to, you know, like I said, different books, different seminars that have helped us through those times to take that next, that next step. And so, like, like I said, that, that's been a big part of us. I'm kind of thinking of two different ways right now to kind of talk. I really do think, I would like to kind of talk about the type of entrepreneurs, you know, from the two directions. One, uh, you know, someone who was looking for a franchise would like to have that. And then also someone who has a business, but maybe even a step back is the thing I have found fascinating in researching for our conversation, because I am so deep into an acquisition entrepreneurship and there's tons of McKinsey studies. There are tons of the Harvard Business School studies. There is the Kellogg School has their reports on acquisition ETA, you know, and the industry is kind of stabilizing. You know, you, a year ago, if you said you were this, they'd be like, no, you're micro, you're this and that. Yeah, you know, now everyone's like, okay, you're an acquisition. But what I found very interesting was there is nothing literally nothing that compares there's talk about the types of business you can and the models and the variations and the probabilities and you know this and strategic the model but not in comparison with a franchise and yet we find this in looking time. at it yeah yeah it is it's kind of like this is pretty much the same exact thing just you know once again a slightly different model you know and there's different yeah you know, yes you have a corporate constraint you have this and that but businesses when you acquire, have constraints and variances and rules and environmental cons- yeah. So it's like I, I was really kind of highly surprised that this, that even just the comparison is not discussed. It's almost yeah. two different audiences. So you know, so take a step this. back, okay? Take a step yeah. back. What what we have to do all the time is we meet with people that are looking for their own business. Now we have to sit mm-hmm. down with them and try to match them up based on their skill set. Who's going to be running the business? Do you want a full-time? Is it a part-time? What kind of funding are we looking at as far as that will dictate which business? Because again, we have 10 different franchise companies that Mm -hmm. we we will talk. And most people come in and they're interested in Sinorama or they're interested in food. They're interested in our Great Greek or our, our Grace Craze food business, right? Or they might be interested in co-working and it's Venture X or Office Evolution, yeah, I saw that, yeah. right? And so each one of our businesses, are they're different and they, they attract different people. But then also we have to look and say, are those people good matches for that business? And so when we were talking before this, we talked a little bit about coaching, right? And that's really the idea that coaches would kind of pick it, help the person gear the business toward their strengths and they would then hire their weaknesses in the business because nobody has all the attributes that you need to be, you know, a large franchise owner. Like it just, you, you're going to need other pieces. And like we all do, right? Nobody makes it on their own. You always need, you need other people and you need other people to bring things to the table. So when we look at that's one side of the equation, that's kind of matching people up. So if, if it were you and I and you were looking at a business, I would be sitting down going, going, tell me about your background. Tell me what you like to do. Tell me what you're really good at. Tell me, you know yourself better than anyone. Tell me what you wouldn't be good at. Tell me what you would like. Tell me, have you managed people? What do you, do you want to have a business where there's a retail location and you go there every day? Or would you rather have something that you work from home? What type of person are you right now in your life? And it's, it's changed. We all change. We all evolve, right? And so your wife uh, leaves a big company. What's going to be a good fit for her, right? And you have to sit down and say, okay, are you going to do this together? Is she going to do this on her own? What's going to happen? You know, as you go through this, you you know, what's the strengths and weaknesses? And you need a really a true third party that will help you do that, okay? And I've done that with many, many people. And so I'm happy to help you if that's something down the road. But then on the other side, Fran... Companies that are successfully run, I I walked into a a chicken business in Houston and the guy said, United Franchise Group, because I'm always wearing my shirt. I always wear my shirt because it's a calling card. 
He said, United Franchise Group, do you turn businesses into franchises? And I said, we do. And we turned that business into a franchise. And so these kind of things happen. Now, is that a franchise that I wanted to invest in? No, I didn't because I didn't want to compete with Chick-fil-A and you know all the other fast foods that are out there. But to me, I look for differentiators any time that we sit down and talk to that entrepreneur that has a good idea. I'm talking to somebody right now who, you want to talk about a niche? This per- They clean um, uh, car seats okay. and strollers. They sanitize Baby car, stuff. Yeah. Car, car seats and strollers. They've been certified to do it. Like the firemen have to get certified to, to mess with car seats, right? And to understand them, they get certified but it's a niche that nobody even thinks about, right? So like Transworld, everybody knows the real estate industry. Everybody knows how real real estate, they sell homes, they sell land, right? But there's a lot of people that don't even know that there's a whole industry out there for selling businesses and for people to buy an existing business. And maybe somebody's at a later stage in their life that they don't wanna go through the startup of starting a franchise, Maybe they'd be better off buying an existing business that's going that they could step in already has employees, already has customers, has an income, and they could fix it. Maybe they could improve it or they, you know, it gives them something to do for the next three to five years or whatever. Right. And so everybody's different. And so you take a step back, whether it's the entrepreneur that has a great business idea and we want to help them scale it, turn it into a franchise and grow it or whether it's the individual that's been working somewhere for years and maybe doesn't get the same benefits financially as others have, or they're ready to go out on their own, but they want some structure. They they don't wanna be by themselves. They wanna build their business for themselves, but not be by themselves. And so that's where a franchise is a great opportunity because we provide training, we provide the setup, We provide the support. We have all the vendors and suppliers for that business already negotiated. So, and then we've been through it for years. So if, you know, and and we can put you in touch with other franchise owners where we get our best ideas from the franchise owners anyway. So if you were a Sinorama owner and you were looking to add, you know, a, a truck, I can put you in touch with 25 owners that have bought that same truck how much they paid, where they bought it, what what they use it for, or maybe there's a better one that you're looking at a piece of equipment. I've had franchise owners tell me that we've saved them hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years because of the deals we get with vendors and suppliers or the directions we give them to go in this direction versus that direction. And that makes a lot of sense. They don't have to spend time on R&D. We're at the trade show in Paris when they're introducing that in the industry. And so whether it's fully promoted with ad specialties and promotional product, or whether it's, you know, our co-working, our fast food, our networking business, or Sinorama, all of our businesses, we look for good, solid people that are, are willing to work, okay? Follow a program, Okay, and really don't have a uh, they're not afraid to speak up. We get our best ideas from the franchise owners. We're not looking for robots. We're not looking for people to just plug in. The way we've evolved our organization is through entrepreneurs. We're an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs. That's yes. kind of how it, it, it is at United Franchise Group. It's funny. It makes me think of um, the scene in The Founder where Ray Kroc all of a sudden gets frustrated with selling franchises to his country club things and starts going to the VF to, you know, to like different groups of people who are working and struggling, you know, who are showing they have determination and like that, like little click, it's like, Oh, people with money sometimes just coast along people who are aspirational. You know, if you could figure out that aspirational angle, you know, for whatever it is and how that transformed it. Yeah. As you talk, I keep thinking about that movie, but taking a step back, I want to hit two different things because one, so much of the audience have an existing business. And so I want to ask you a two part. Let's talk about that creation 
of a franchise. Let's talk about sort of like the time frame, the structural things that happen. Sure. And sort of the mindset that you need to have thinking about, well, is my business or not? And then I kind of want to follow up because now you have me thinking on it literally like what would make a good business for it? Maybe an addendum. Because now also I'm like, maybe I go buy a company that could be then built into a franchise. Yeah. So well, all that's, right, let's... Another, that's another whole level. I do, I'm looking yeah. at myself too. So, so take a step back. So what happened as everything does, it evolved, right? So I'm a huge proponent of franchising. I'm a big believer in, in what franchising has done for our country, uh, franchising. If you look at the job creation, if you look at the taxes paid, franchising is the big, big driver. It's not big business. It's the franchising that is done in this country that drives our economy. So I would go speak at different franchise companies' conventions. I was at a frozen yogurt. I, I remember I'm flying to Indianapolis and my wife is going, why are you going to Indianapolis? And, and I said, well, I'm speaking at the frozen custard you know, franchise company's convention. She goes, what do you know about frozen custard? And I said, I don't know anything about frozen custard. I, you know, but they asked me to speak and I'll do it. So, but as I was doing this and, and, and from time to time, and I had a board meeting and the board says to me, Ray, you're putting some extra time into these other companies and we're not getting paid anything for that. And we're, you're taking time away from the business that we do get paid for and everybody gets paid for if you want to keep doing that, why don't you just turn it into a business? And I'm okay. So I came up with the name Accurate Franchising Incorporated, AFI, and we started offering our services to other businesses out there. And we started not only getting franchise companies that wanted us to help and, uh, you know, whether it was mediation or whether it was, uh, you know, things that we had been through as an organization all these years that we could help them with marketing campaigns and, you know, all different things. But then new people that had great ideas started coming along and saying, can you turn me into a franchise? And then that became the business. Now, today we do about eight to 10 of those a month that we turn into a franchise company. And I, these pass my desk every day, right? And so my wife accuses me of having my own personal shark tank here in West Palm Beach that I get to see all these new ideas <laughs> yeah. is all the time. And she's kind of right in that regard because that's where Gray's Craze came from. And that's where, you know, as we go through this trans world and I could go through a lot of, you know, this has led us to other opportunities and other brands. So it's been a great part of our business and led us into more franchisor services that we've gotten into as, as well. So helping the, the entrepreneur understand franchising and it's not easy. It's complicated. There's a lot of laws. There's a lot of things to franchising. Yeah, and, and so you want to do it right. You know, I had a guy here last month that said, I want to, I want to turn my business into a franchise, right? I sat down with him and he had been in business for two months. I said, people want to buy a franchise that's a proven commodity. They don't want to buy something that you've been doing for two months and you're still trying to figure this out. Come back in another six months or a year after you have the thing figured out and you're running it smoothly, successfully. Again, people don't want to be a guinea pig. They want to be, they want something that's been proven. And here it is, right? And so take it in steps. And so that's, that person will come back. Now we established Exit Factor as a business model here because we're in the business brokerage business and our franchise owners at Transworld kept running into people that they weren't ready to sell their business, right? So, but they weren't going to take the time. They didn't have the knowledge. They didn't know what to do with these people, right? So we established Exit Factor and Exit Factor, Jessica Fiakovich is my president there and just does an amazing job with this company, but her and her team will work with these entrepreneurs and counsel them month after month after month to take them through a process to increase the value of their business. Right now, I think the average is 56% improvement in valuation from the time they meet the person to the time they go to sell it, okay? 
That's and huge. Yeah. Some people think, oh my God, what does that mean? Well, let me just tell you, instead of selling your Millions. business for 300,000, you're selling it for 475,000, right? Instead of selling your business for 800,000, you're selling it for 1.3 million, right? And so as you start to look at this, we can make a huge positive influence on those entrepreneurs. And so earlier I said, you know, lifelong learning and books was a big part of who I am and how we built our company. The other thing that if I was to say, what's the other thing that's that driving force behind our organization and what it's, it's a positive mental attitude. It's a positive attitude with our franchise owners, with our industries, with our company, it's being positive and, and taking advantage of our advantages and taking advantage of the opportunities that are in front of us. So where a lot of people during the pandemic were, woo is me, I can't go to work, there's nothing I can do. We were exactly the opposite. We, we got hurt for the first maybe 60 days trying to figure out what's going on, right? And then one of our franchise owners said, you know, we have the largest collection of clear plexiglass sheets in the back of our stores because we make signs out of these things, right? We cut them up and make signs out of them. Well, what if we did all the sneeze guards? So all of a sudden, Sinorama jumped into that business and we were the had the largest collection of four by eight sheets of plexiglass, clear plexiglass. All and we stores, were hanging that, sneeze yeah. guards in every store, everywhere, putting graphics on the floor where people should stand. We pivoted our business to meet the needs of that time. I'll give you another example. VentureX, perfect example. VentureX, they're telling us we can't even go to our location. You got to close your business in all these different states. You can't go New York, California. You can't, you can't go to the business. Well, we have mailboxes in VentureX. We deliver the mail. We have to be open to have the mail, just like the post office had to be open during COVID. So we were an excused business from all of those. We were able to stay open. And a lot of other businesses in our same industry didn't realize that, that they could do that. And we did that with our franchisees. And so you know, as you go through fully promoted, had safety masks with companies' names on them. And each one of our businesses, we pivoted the business and we were able to move. But it's having that positive attitude to always look for the lemonade out of the lemon, to always look for the silver lining, the opportunity that others aren't looking at, that people were looking to just hold on. And what we said is, we don't want to hold on. We want to expand during this time. We didn't close VentureX stores. We opened 14 VentureX locations during the pandemic. It was their grand openings, okay? So what I'm, what I'm saying is that you have to take a contrarian view when, when you're in business and everybody's running this way and you need to take a step back and go, how can I use my advantages to take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of us? Yep. Where everyone goes left, how can you go right? And it is the fun of that being entrepreneur, but I love that you've built this organization and because you're referencing things that actually take work. Yeah, because you were talking about the knowledge you've gained from the books, but to have that passed down, it's one thing for you to have that knowledge, but then to have your organization on exactly. multiple levels be able to flow that type of thing. That is difficult work. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs, oh, yes, we do that. I'm like, okay, but having been that, I know the first 90 times you do that, it's kind of like, eh, eh. <laughs> and then like, eh, you kind of go, oh, if we do this, we just, oh, wait. It, yeah, it's like that takes a lot of practice and iteration. Yeah, just keep saying iteration. But in doing that, that shows just the progress you guys have made. And that is really impressive. You've talked about sort of, you know, where you want to go and, you know, be more and more about guiding other entrepreneurs into this. How do you look, you know, here you are, multi-generational family, you know, second generation with multiple new generations following up. How are you looking to define your success? Because I know you said you don't really look at your piece, but so often I think entrepreneurs fall into the trap and I know I did way, I mean, someone would ask me how I was doing. I'm like, well, the business did this, you know, and it was like, oh, the business is happening this. And it's like, yeah, that, we're two entities. 
how do you go about defining what success is for you? Well, I, I mean, look, in, in the beginning, when you first start a business, it's easy to find what success is. Are you paying your bills? Okay. Yep. Are you, are you making money or, and so you go through these levels where I want to get the business to break even. Then I want to be making some money. Then I want to be making a lot more money. And, but we've kind of gone beyond that paradigm. Okay. So it's now for me in that, you know, again, I turned 60. So I've got uh, two granddaughters, okay, that are on my mind. <laughs> my wife and I hold them, right? so Granddaughter mug. Last That's year was brilliant. our last year was our best year ever. We had two granddaughters last year, right? And so yep. what best, we start yeah. to look at are a little different. You said you had kids in their teens, and you're gonna look at hey, graduation and colleges and all different stages of life. And some people try to run their life separate, my personal life and my business life. And they try to run them separate. And that's a big mistake that people make, right? You only have one calendar. You only have one life. You got to intertwine them all. Like it's it's who you are. And so you, you take a step back. I, I went to a lot of graduations, okay? My kids' graduations from high school, college, you know, all these graduations. And you hear the same message every single graduation, okay? In a different form or maybe a different speaker, a different way, but... It all revolves around finding something that you love to do. This is the theme. This is what we're telling our kids. And if I got up there, I would tell them that is the biggest amount of crap that you would ever get in your whole life. Okay. Cause I love music, but I can't play a musical instrument. Right. <laughs> yes. So, so the reality is you should not be in search of, finding something you love. Those are for vacations and, and off time. Those are for hobbies. What you should be doing is finding something you're good at. Find the things that you're good at and build your career and your business around what you're good at. And don't worry about what you love, okay? Because if you're good at it, trust me, you'll end up loving it, okay? Because you're good at it, you'll make a lot of money, you'll get accolades, you'll become You'll, you'll end up loving it. And there'll, you'll still have other things you love, but those are hobbies. Those are vacations. Those are family things. Those are other things that you're going to enjoy. So, you know, look, uh, I, I, I love beer. I'm going to Oktoberfest <laughs> in September. Okay. Nice. To Munich. I'm going to, we're taking the family. We're going to Munich. Right. And so we're going uh, to Oktoberfest. I love beer, but I'm not making my career around beer. <laughs> that would be a mistake. Okay. So my, my point to you is that you got to find what you're good at. You got to look, the entrepreneur has to look in the mirror and say, I'm really good with customers. I'm really good at selling things. I'm really good at operations. I'm really good with my hands. I'm really good. Uh, you know, I'll work harder than anybody, whatever that is, those things are, you put them together and you say, okay, now what kind of business makes sense? for me to utilize these things that I'm really good at. It's so true. And, you know, the other kind of fun thing about like saying, oh, my passion is this, but you know, here, I'm going to focus on where I'm good at. Literally, when you were talking about Oktoberfest, I have a good friend, another entrepreneur, who jokes that in college, his only real interest was beer. Like he loved to drink. And he was like, ah, you know, and to the fact where he said he did, you know, it, you know, that microbrewery thing kind of hit really crazy in the early 90s. But like from the 880s, he was like, OK, I looked there was like Anheuser-Busch, it was chemical engineering and, you know, kind of like kind of went down that path to the point, realized that wasn't for him, but was a very good programmer. And he developed an early development shop in New York City, go through multiple, you know, They've grown like crazy. Literally, he's made some great deals where he did the development for equity and all crazy types of startups and made tons of money. He recently bought a brewery and I'm going there tonight of all things. And he was joking. It's like, I finally got my lifelong passion. There you now, go. He's done amazingly, but it is. That's, that's, you have to balance it. Yeah. You do. You do. And, and everybody does. And, and so, you know, it, it, it's just kind of gearing your business toward your strength and hiring your weaknesses. I'm not a detail guy. 
All right. So I have a great COO. I have a great CFO. I have, you know, I have, I have a great executive assistant. Okay. Who's looking at me through the window right now, waving, saying we've gone over our time. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, and <laughs> so, so these people that keep me on track or to help me from, yeah. a, you know, from an organizational standpoint, which is so important in business to be organized. Right. And so it's not a one man thing or, or, I mean, initially, yeah, I was running a store and it was me and, uh, you know, three or four employees and, and it was more on what I did. And, yeah. and so it's the, in the beginning, it's the work ethic. I, I remember I was still living at home and I came home one night. I thought, you know, it's seven o'clock at night. I came home, I put in a really good day and I came home and my mom was at the kitchen table and there was a, a guy with a book with pictures and he was pitching her on in-ground sprinklers. I was getting a glass of water at the sink and listened. And this guy was there till 830. And what dawned on me was I am getting beat in business by the in-ground sprinkler salesman that's at my house right now. So I went in the next day and I said, I'm open for business till eight o'clock now. If you guys have an appointment or anything else. So I worked longer hours and harder hours. And and so I didn't want to get beat by the sprinkler salesman, right? And so uh, what in the beginning, it's work ethic. That's what it's all about. I mean, it, you put the time in, you get the reps in, as you like said earlier, right? Yeah. You get really good at something, but you got to put the time in at it. And, you know, what do they say? You need, uh, you know, 10,000 hours to become an expert in anything, right? And and so you got to put the time and effort into it. But then how do you take advantage as you're building and growing it? And it's seeing those opportunities that are presented. We, we happen to live in a country and live in a place where these opportunities are in front of us every single day, okay? It's, some people don't see them and some people do. I sit down next to somebody in an airplane and they have their headset on, right? And we don't say one word and I could be the solution for their biggest problem that they have right next to them. And they didn't take advantage of that. And sometimes I sit down next to somebody and, I, and we start talking and they're my solution, right? They help me with finding a different vendor or supplier or insurance or whatever it might be. So I think it, business, we complicate business. Everybody complicates it so much. Simplify it. Always look to keep it simple and stay focused on what is the most important things that need to happen. Too many people have a to-do list, 17 things, and they get number 15, number 11 done, they get number nine done, but they don't get one, two, and three done. And one, two, and three add up to way more than all the others combined. So I, while I have a to-do list, I have a goal list and my goals are always three goals. I don't have more than three goals because if you have more than three, it's a to-do list. So it goes over to the to-do list, but the, we're very goal oriented at United Franchise Group. We believe in setting high goals uh, and, and really pushing and challenging our people to meet those high goals. Well, Greg, I really think that is great. And yeah, I saw that, I saw your you know, discussion on that on LinkedIn where you posted that. So, because I know your assistant is there and kind of, so thank her for, thank them first for uh, letting me get a little more of your time, but how can the audience find you and, you know, where should they go and what should they be thinking? Well, I think, I think the, the, if you're an entrepreneur that's looking potentially to turn your business into a franchise or considering that, Accurate Franchising Incorporated is the best company to do that, right? So you can go to accuratefranchisingincorporated.com. You'll see it. You can go to unitedfranchisegroup.com and all our brands are listed there and you can get there from there as well. So if you're somebody that's looking for a franchise, let's say, you know, one of our franchises, uh, you, you have some interest in, in whether it's real estate or the brokerage business or co-working or you know, you're just looking for a great business, okay? We've got some great businesses available. Go to United Franchise Group, request some information. We'll have somebody talk to you about it and, and kind of go from there. But uh, 
I would just, to us, from our end, we're looking to match the right people up at the right time in their lives in the right business, right? So and we have a limited, you know, we have 10 different franchise companies that we have and we can offer folks to, to look at. But if we're not a good fit, if somebody, you know, is, is passionate about cutting hair, we don't have a hair salon, right? But over at Franvesco, which is our company that works for a lot of other franchise companies, they service a company that does that. And so we can kind of steer them into other businesses that we have nothing to do with, okay? No, we don't own them. We, we just want to help people get the right business at the right time in their life so that they can be successful. And obviously, if they're going to have a business, they're going to need signs. So we'd like them to go to Signorama for signs. They're going <laughs> yeah. to need uniforms. We want them to go to fully promoted for uniforms, caps, jackets. They're going to want to sell their business sometime. And we want Transworld to sell their business for them. So we, once you're, you know, we work together, we'd love to be able to expand on that relationship, you know, long-term, long-term, build a great relationship and do it long-term. Very cool. We'll make sure everyone that all this is in the show notes, all the different links and also the reasoning for why. Um, we'll also include it in the email when this episode comes out. So if you're hearing this episode, just go check out and make sure you subscribe to our newsletter and you'll be able to see all this. And of course, on our socials, Ray, thank you. This has been great. I really appreciate it. And I love talking with another Long Island guy. <laughs> so thank you for coming on the well, show. Hey, nothing better than Huntington during Christmas with all the lights going across the street yes. and everything else. So beautiful, beautiful place, hey. but really good spending time. Yes. Thank you, Ray. I really right. appreciate it. Take care. You have a good one. You Bye-bye. too. Bye-bye. Hey, hey, everyone. Just remember. Um, Thank you so much for listening. And look, if you enjoyed today's conversation, please go share it, especially if you think there's, you know, someone who is thinking about franchising or their own business to go share with them. They could learn a lot from Ray and tell them to go subscribe also while they're at it. All right, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Talk to you soon. Bye bye.